Hey there, Camels. My name is Nalan, and I'm a software engineer working with Richard on the OCaml language team here at Jane Street. Previous videos in this series have covered aspects of the mode system, which is capable of tracking properties of values such as locality. But another area under active development is that of the kind system, which can express things like the memory layout of different types. As an everyday OCaml programmer, I really appreciate the simplicity of its memory model, and I wanted to make a couple of videos diving into this aspect of the language in more detail, as well as covering some of our work on things like unboxed types. Now, in pretty much any OCaml program, there are a few flavors uh, or kinds of type that one is likely to encounter. And the first one of these that I wanted to talk about um, is called immediate. So this includes types such as unit, which has a single value, this pair of parentheses here, um, and is often thought of as the type of side-affecting computations where you don't want to return anything meaningful. We also have uh, Boolean values, bool, also true. Um, we also have uh, chars, which are simply like uh, single byte ASCII characters. So if I just type a char into my REPL here, it'll tell me, oh yeah, this thing is a char. Um, similarly, we have ints, which are the type of sign, signed integers. And the th being immediates, the thing that unifies all of these types is that they're all actually represented by OCaml integers. Uh, and I can write a, a helper function to convert any one of these values to an integer, uh, just so we can kind of ins inspect how it's actually represented. I'm going to give it a type annotation so the REPL knows what to do with it. I'm also going to assert that this thing is actually an int. Um, and then I'm going to call object magic which is basically an unsafe reinterpret cast where whatever the thing was before, now it's going to be an int. Cool. So now I have this to int function from any old alpha to int. And if I call it on unit, we can see that unit is actually represented by the integer 0. Similarly for false, whereas true is represented by the integer 1. Uh, if I call it on a char, I should get the ASCII bytecode for this char. And if I call it on int, well, hopefully I get the same int back out. Now, once one has some primitive types in their programming language, of course, the natural thing to do is to compose them into data structures and other sorts of collections. Um, so for example, I might want to have like a homogeneous list or homogeneous array of integers. Um, that might look something like this. But I can also have heterogeneous uh, structurally typed uh, tuples of values, such as this triple, um, where I can say have a, an int, um, a char, and a bool. The camel supports that just fine. Um, and I can also define my own uh, record types, which are nominal types. Um, for example, I might want to define a pair with two fields. First, let's make it an int. And second, let's make it a char. And this gives me some nice syntax to construct one of these, like so. And unlike the immediate types that we looked at previously, uh, these types are all boxed, meaning that the runtime must actually allocate a block of heap memory to represent their contents. Um, and again, I can write a simple helper function to inspect how big the runtime thinks the, the blo heap block is for any one of these values. So first off, I'm going to um, get the representation of my uh, object, which is, uh, this is just a identity function. It's just doing some type magic under the hood. I'm going to assert that this thing is actually a block, so I'm not trying to call it on an int. And then I'm going to call op.size um, to get me the size of my thing. Cool. And you can see that if I call this on my array that I defined previously, I get four because the array had four elements. If I call this on my triple, I get three because there were three things in that triple. And if I call it on my pair, I should get two because my pair has two fields. Cool. Uh, but this kind of poses a question. Uh, first off, like how does the runtime know whether something is represented as uh, an integer, i.e. it's an immediate, um, or it's represented by a pointer to a block? Um, and secondly, if it is a pointer to a block, like how does it know how big that block actually is? And to be clear, 
it's not just that the runtime needs to know how to do this uh, so that I can write these helper functions here. Um, but as you may also be aware, OCaml is a garbage collected language, uh, meaning that the garbage collector uh, needs to be able to look at basically any arbitrary OCaml value, decide, hey, is this thing an int or a pointer? And if so, how much memory does it point to? So it can, for example, free up that memory. Um, and the way that OCaml manages to do this involves a couple of tricks. So first off, to distinguish between ints and pointers, OCaml uses something called tagged integers. Um, specifically, uh, any block allocated by the runtime is guaranteed to be word aligned. So all pointers in OCaml look something like this in binary. So you, know, you have a bunch of binary bits. Um, and at the end, there's always three zeros because the address is a multiple of eight bytes. Then the runtime is able to steal uh, the lowermost bit um, for and, and set it to one for integers, such that uh, the GC can simply look at the leastmost bit. And if it's one, then it knows this thing is an integer. And if it's zero, it knows this thing is a pointer. Um, and this only leaves us 63 bits to work with for integers. But this is more than enough for most use cases. It's very rare that you actually need 64 bits of precision in integers. Um, it does make certain arithmetic operations a bit slower than they otherwise could be, though. Um, to actually figure out, like, once this thing is a pointer, like, how big is the block that it points to, uh, the trick there is also pretty simple. Um, whenever OCaml goes to allocate a block, it allocates an extra one word header at the start of the block. And I'm going to paste in some ASCII art here just to show you what that looks like. So this is a, a diagram of an OCaml block header. And as you can see, uh, the first 54 bits are the size. Um, and this encodes the size in words of the block. And so when I um, call this opt.size function up here, uh, all it's doing is it's going and it's reading out these 54 bits from the block header. And uh, given that this is the size in words, I think that 54 bits is enough to represent something like 16 petabytes uh, worth of data, which is like way more than enough for like basically any use case. I can't imagine what I'd do with a block that big. Um, so that's how OCaml solves that problem. Um, but what are these other fields in the header for? Uh, the next two bits we can see are the color. Uh, this is used internally by the garbage collector, and I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, but this last thing, the tag, um, is a single one byte value. Um, and it's used in a few different ways by the runtime, which I want to dive into now. So the first way in, in which the tag's used is uh, that there are actually a few remaining primitive types that don't fit nicely into our model of everything being either a 64 bit a word aligned pointer or a 63 bit tagged integer. For example, um, for applications like machine learning, uh, it's very useful to have floats. And OCaml, of course, supports floats. Um, and this is actually a 64 bit IEEE double. Um, but this is a problem, because with 64 bits of precision, uh, you can't always set the leastmost bit to 1, indicating, hey, this thing is not a pointer. Don't follow it. Um, but if it's 0, you don't want the GC thinking that your float is actually a pointer and following it off into some random region of memory and causing seg faults and things like that. So the way OCaml solves this is it actually has to box floats, meaning that whenever um, there's a float in an OCaml program, the uh, runtime will allocate um, a one-word block on the heap. and uh, in the tag of that block, it will say, uh, use a special value called the double tag, just 253, uh, which the GC knows means, hey, don't scan this block. It contains a float. Um, and again, I can write a little simple helper function here to prove that this is the case. So again, I'm just going to get the representation of my object. This is, again, a no op. I'm going to assert that the thing is actually a block. Uh, and then I'm going to call tag, And this, again, just reads the tag out of the header. And you can see that if I call this on a float, oops, oh, my assertion failed uh, because that thing was not a float. But if I call it on a float, um, I get 253, which, again, is the double tag. Another type that has this problem, actually, is strings. So if I have an arbitrary string in OCaml, like, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, um, this is just a tightly packed array of um, single byte characters. And therefore, we can't really guarantee that any given word within the string ends in a one or zero bit. Um, and so uh, we, we, again, don't want the GC like uh, reading some random word out of our string and thinking it's a pointer and following it into oblivion. Uh, and so if we look at the tag of strings in OCaml, um, they have another special value, 252, which is the string tag. And in general, uh, the GC knows that any tag of 251 or greater um, means that this block does not contain scannable data, and it won't try to interpret it as pointers. 
The other way in which the tag is used most commonly is to represent different variant constructors. So much like I can define my own record type in OCaml, I can also define a variant type, which might look something like this. Say a, b of int, c, d of string. Cool. And naturally, you might be asking yourself, well, how is this thing represented? Well, if we think about it from first principles, there's kind of a couple of different bits of information that we need to represent. First off, we need to keep track of like which constructor we're talking about. Um, this is often called like the discriminant, especially in other programming languages. Um, but then we also uh, need to keep track of some additional data that might be associated with that constructor uh, for some constructors like B and D. Uh, and the way that OCaml does this is it actually divides the constructors up into two families, those that have no payload, no argument, like A and C, and those that have an argument, like B and D. And then it numbers them both independently, starting from 0. And for immediate constructors, like A and, and C, where we only need to represent the discriminant, these are actually represented by OCaml integers. So I can use my toIn function from earlier to demonstrate this. So we can see that a got integer 0, c got integer 1. If I added another one, say like e, it would get integer 2, and so on and so forth. Um, but for the constructors that do have a payload, uh, we encode which uh, constructor they are into the tag of the block. So if I use my tag function from earlier on, say, b17, this should produce 0 because it is the first um, non-immediate constructor. Uh, and if I use it on, um, say, like d of some string, then I get 1 because it is the second um, non-immediate constructor. And this actually means that there is a cap on like how many non-immediate constructors you can have on a variant uh, in OCaml, but it's you know, around 250, and that's like more than enough for most use cases. So this is all pretty simple, right? Uh, one of the things I really love about programming in OCaml is that you can show me pretty much any type definition, and I can tell you exactly how it's going to be laid out in memory. And this all serves to make like, the runtime remarkably simple and the GC pretty efficient. In future videos, I plan to talk more about how we're making these traditional value types uh, live in harmony with unbox types, but this is all I really wanted to cover for now. Thanks for watching.